I'm Maritza. I'm a, currently a student at OSU. I'm a graduate student at OSU. I'm in my last uh, semester trying to get out <laughs> and wrap up uh, my research project. And my research is on black farmers and climate adaptation. And I studied um, Ohio and North Carolina. I talked to farmers in Ohio and in North Carolina. These are the questions that I'm going to be answering in this presentation. So I wanted to know how black farmers were experiencing climate change, um, how they were adapting to climate change, and how they were engaging in, with their institutions to increase their resilience to climate change. And the reason I am asking those questions is because I did not see uh, in the literature on climate adaptation, a lot on black farmers. Actually, I saw very little uh, in terms of like research papers that were written about black farmers. So that piqued my interest. A lot of the research on climate adaptation, especially in the social science, is uh, in the Midwest. And typically the farmer that is studied is your typical large scale uh, white farmer. So that was one of my uh, motivation. But <clears throat> Regardless of my own motivation, I think that this is a topic worth studying, especially considering that the unique history of Black farmers in the U.S. combined with those factors down there, climate vulnerability, how what's all the way at the top, Black farmers' uh, experiences with uh, racial discrimination, how that uh, interact with exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity to give uh, Black farmers a certain level of vulnerability that um, not all farmers may have. So that in itself makes this topic in my eye worthy of studying. So in the literature, a lot of the questions that um, social scientists are looking into are, um, what are the changes that farmers are making on the ground? So we know that climate change is happening. How are farmers trying to cope? And some of those changes include changing the way they plant, um, changing the type of things they plant. Um, there's the structure, the infrastructure, irrigation, et cetera. Um, social scientists are also interested in seeing what are some of the determinants of adaptation to climate change, because if we know what type of uh, indicators we need to look for, it, we can influence programming that are going to help farmers adapt to climate change. Um, also of importance is the relationship between the way you view climate change and your willingness to actually do something about it. So there's research on that to see how farmers' attitude influence their behavior. Also, how risk perception influence the way farmers go about adapting to climate change. If they think climate change is actually something that's going to uh, affect their livelihood, they're going to be more likely to do something about it. So those are some of the uh, research that folks are doing. And now I'm going to talk more about the climate vulnerability here. So climate vulnerability, when we think about what makes somebody vulnerable to climate change, we think of those three factors. We think of exposure. What are you exposed to? So we know that people down in the Caribbean are more likely to experience category five hurricanes now than we are here, just because we're here and they're located over there. So our exposure to certain impacts is going to be different. Sensitivity has to do with how much uh, of a damage are you going to sustain? And that has to do with factors such as the physical. So your uh, soil, depending on what state it's in, uh, you may have two fields that have the same exposure, but they have different sensitivity because of their characteristic. And that also applies to people. We have different type of economic resources or social situation uh, as farmers, and those things are going to make us more sensitive to certain things. And then we have adaptive capacity. 
adaptive capacity um, has to do with uh, how we leverage uh, the resources, the social network information, uh, et cetera, to cope with climate change. And together, these three factors influence vulnerability to climate change. So at the top, we see that if we have a lot of exposure and great sensitivity, it's going to be hard to develop a strong uh, adaptive capacity. So you have, if you have a lot of sensitivity, a great exposure to certain impacts and very little adaptive capacity, then you're more vulnerable to climate change. And the opposite is true. If you are not as sensitive, so sensitivity is low, uh, you're more likely to have a greater adaptive capacity. The more you uh, develop that adaptive capacity, the less sensitive you're going to be. If you're less exposed, then that means you are in a better position to develop your adaptive capacity. And that would mean that we would have lower vulnerability. And that's where we want to be. So in order to adapt to climate change, we need to make sure that our vulnerability is, is low. We want to lower that vulnerability. Okay, so what are some vulnerability to climate change that you may have? And that's a list that's not complete. We can come up with all type of examples apart from those that are here. So physical. Um, what is the state of uh, the infrastructure on our farm? Uh, what is the biophysical state uh, uh, of the farm? Um, what, are, what is the state of our community, uh, our finances, our governance? Do we have the adequate policies? Um, are we at risk of losing plants that have cultural relevance that are going to just like go bye-bye because we no longer have those plants that are at risk of extension and culture is going to go with that. And in farming also, we know that culture plays a role in what people eat, et cetera. So those things are important. So as far as my research, I wanted to give some type of background in terms of the vocabulary that I use. So what did I do? So as I mentioned earlier, I talked to folks in Ohio and in North Carolina. So I did uh, what um, social scientists call snowball sampling. So you go, you find somebody to talk to, and then they tell you, well, you should talk to so-and-so, and then you should talk to so-and-so. So that's kind of what I did. And I conducted 37 interviews, 15 in Ohio and 22 in North Carolina. So some differences between Ohio and North Carolina that I think um, is important um, for the findings and how uh, folks are experiencing uh, climate impact and what resources they have available to them. So first we have the difference between the 1890s and the 1862. Are you all familiar with those two things? Can somebody tell me what's in 1890, what's in 1862? Yeah, yeah, oh. universities. Yeah, the land grant universities. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so for folks who may not know, we had the Morrill Act that uh, was passed in 1862 that granted land, vast amount of land to universities. And we have uh, a university like Ohio State, which is an 1862 uh, land grant university, but um, black folks were not welcome in those spaces. So later a second act was passed and we had the 1890s. So why am I mentioning this? It's because in Ohio and in North Carolina, the situation is different. In North Carolina, you have in, um, uh, an 1890 university, NCANC, that was established in 1891. So there's a lot of history uh, there. Um, and they have a time to establish a connection and um, longevity. Whereas here um, in Ohio, we have Central State, who 
which also has been there for a long time, but Central State was granted land grant university status in 2014. So it's not quite the same thing in terms of the history of uh, connecting uh, with the people and reaching out and all of that. Uh, organizational landscape is different in terms of the uh, type of organization engaging in uh, the farming space. Uh, so in North Carolina, you have a lot more um, organizations that are giving out programs um, fo focused on Black farmers or BIPOC folks in general. And then lastly, there's the interinstitutional collaboration. So going back to this uh, NCANT, Central State, Ohio State, et cetera. So in North Carolina, AT, NCA, uh, NCANT had more time to collaborate with, with NCSU and establish those relationships, whereas in Ohio, those relationships are there, but they are not as advanced. And that has some implication as far as like resources. So what did I find? So first, what are folks saying in terms of how they're being impacted? So here we see that the changes that people were mentioning had to do with uh, extreme weather, temperature change, uh, the season changing, pest pressure, flooding, uh, et cetera. And here I put some quotes that somewhat summarize like some of those changes. You see how people are mentioning like when it's wet, it's wet, uh, it's wet, when it's dry, it's dry. The fluctuation um, and the weather. So definitely people are noticing that something is different. And that's the majority of the Black farmers I talked to were saying that they were noticing changes. Now, there is a small minority among those farmers who were not quite convinced uh, as far as like what is causing climate change. So here you see um, that we have two folks. They're not saying that climate change isn't real, but they're saying that maybe it's not people doing it. Maybe something else is out there doing it. So we have somebody saying, well, this has always been this way. We've had changes since the earth was earth. Things were happening. Uh, it's like nothing to worry about. And that people are doing too much. And then down here, um, you also have uh, somebody saying that, well, it's not the farmers. Don't put the blame on us. It's not us. Yes, climate change is real, but it's not us. So, and then you have like a very small number, I think it was two people who did not notice, notice any changes at all. They said that they, over the like past 20 years that they've been farming, things have remained the same. So I pulled up this quote because I thought it was funny how <laughs> they describe Ohio and the weather like a moody woman. But anyway. So farmers are noticing that climate change is happening. How are they being impacted? So these are some of the impact farmers have told me. Um, they are noticing uh, that they're losing th their crops, that they have more pest damage, uh, that their household is being impacted in terms of the revenue that they're bringing in, in terms of the stress that they're experiencing, in terms of the labor. Because if you have more pest pressure, you may have to be out there a little bit more to deal with it. Folks also mentioned weather related impacts, such as like excessive heat, um, like uh, excess water, et cetera. And some of the social or community impact uh, had to do with uh, stress, mental health issue, as well as um, food shortages. So here, um, this is an example of somebody who told me that they used to grow peaches and they can no longer do that because it just won't grow where they are now. Uh, there's also pest pressure that because of the heat, you have the winds that are uh, really coming out and becoming like uh, harder to get rid of. And you have to be out there a little bit more to deal uh, with them. 
as far as concern, um, climate concern, like, um, well, I was going to say this concern, like in terms of climate concerns, what are farmers saying? So here it was interesting. Um, for the most part, the farmers uh, I talked to said they were concerned about climate change. This is something that they are um, watching closely. Uh, but then you had people who were saying about 30, uh, 24 percent combined were saying that they were not concern about climate change. And then here I have these uh, concern but and not concern but. So the concern but are people who are worried about um, climate change, but not necessarily for themselves. So they think it's an issue, but maybe uh, for the community or in general, but I'm not worried about myself. And then the not concerned but are the people who are not concerned because of uh, adaptation strategies that they have um, implemented, but they think it is an important issue. So I'll show you some example. Um, here we have the people who are very concerned that are saying that they have anxiety, that even with their tenants, they are concerned about what type of practices uh, their tenants or implementing on the farm, you have the people who are not concerned. So the people who are not concerned are people who have a certain type of outlook in life. So you have the type of people who are not worriers uh, by default. So climate change is not a problem for them. People who uh, find their refuge in their faith, climate change uh, does not shake them. Um, so now the not concern, but. So I have folks who told me that I'm not concerned, but I think we need to make the changes. Uh, or below here, you see somebody who's already doing those changes. So saying that as long as I have my high tunnel, uh, I can still produce and grow, then I'm going to be okay. So why I think this was uh, important, uh, this specific findings, is that in the literature on climate adaptation, people usually tie anxiety towards uh, climate change with action. So they think that the more anxious somebody is, the more they show uh, climate grief or uh, those type of attitudes, uh, the more um, they are likely to implement sustainable practices on their farm and adapt to climate change. But what I saw here is that there could be some cultural factors at play uh, and that not everybody is uh, going to have the same outlook or the same angst or express it in the same way. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't think uh, climate change is important. And so the, for the Black farmers I talked to, it's not like they're like, super anxious, but they do recognize that this is a problem. So I think that's important to put out there in the conversation that we have about climate change and uh, recognize that different people talk about climate change uh, in different ways. So what are farmers doing? So here um, we see changes in infrastructure, conservation practices, crop uh, focus changes. So infrastructure, people are putting high tunnel, people are um, purchasing uh, irrigation um, uh, inf uh, infrastructure, people are having green uh, houses, so those type of changes. The conservation are the folks that are doing pollination, and then the crop focus are folks that are changing their planting schedule, changing what they plant and all of that. And then there's a minority, like about 14% who are not quite um, doing like anything. So here I put some examples of what folks were doing in terms of putting, uh, changing their infrastructure, um, changing the crops, uh, and going through um, trials to see what type of fruit is best suited and more tolerant to, so that they can plant it and not have issues. What I thought was interesting is uh, folks in North Carolina who are diversifying their location. So they would decide where to plant and they would uh, analyze the weather and see what's going on and then decide 
okay, I'm going to go in this plot over there in Raleigh. I'm going to go over here and plant now that I have a better idea of how the temperature is going to be and how um, I'm going to be in a better position if I do this. So as far as challenges uh, are concerned, um, people who are facing farm-focused challenges such as labor, access to market, weather, uh, finances, uh, that's a big one. Access to resources, uh, it's a big one. About 62% of the folks that I talked to mentioned that they had trouble accessing uh, resources, so that remains a problem. Uh, there were community uh, based challenges and the community based challenges uh, had to do with folks not feeling safe in rural areas as, as black people and afraid that they might be victim of uh, racist attacks. So that was part of it. Um, how the youth, the black youth was uh, considering farming was part of those community uh, based challenges. So here we see and the way people are talking about those challenges, it's also racialized. Um, we see people, uh, folks complaining about labor and pointing out as a challenge, but also saying that as a black farmer, this is specifically a challenge for me. Uh, when it comes to access to market, uh, we had some folks who felt that um, because of their race, they had an added layer of challenge to access market because there are opportunities that are discussed and that are given to other people that are not given to them. Um, and again, access to resources, also a racialized factor, and we know this. Upfront course, uh, upfront costs of certain uh, programs. So you have uh, a program that you might uh, be interested in, but you still have to put down a certain amount. So how are you even supposed to compete and participate in that program? So that's like uh, certainly a, a challenge for farmers. Access to irrigation system was a challenge. So now we see um, all of this, that black farmers are having challenges. And if we are going to uh, adapt to climate change, those challenges need to be addressed because you cannot um, have climate adaptation efforts or climate adaptation policies without addressing uh, some of those uh, challenges. Because if we are going to be successful in um, mitigating climate change in providing farmers with support, we have to recognize that some farmers may have it uh, a little bit worse than others. So as far as institutions are concerned, I didn't put tables for those because I'm still uh, calculating and processing those uh, results. But overall, I'll say that for the most part, people were engaging with organizations like the USDA or Extension. However, their trust was mixed because of past experiences. So for the trust that they have in those uh, institutions was mixed because of past experiences that they have. So in North Carolina, people were more likely to have direct experiences with those um, type of discrimination situation. Whereas in Ohio, it, it, it happened, but it was more so collective memory and people recalling what happened and being a little bit cautious about engaging with certain institutions. So here are some quotes of what uh, people have uh, experience and what they're saying in terms of why they might not be willing to engage with certain institutions. So here you see somebody saying that um, history has been that the USDA didn't want to work uh, with Black folks. So stuff like that have left a bad taste in people of color mouth, and it's hard to get over that. So there is uh, something to be said about uh, how racial trauma and past trauma show up in the way that Black farmers navigate their relationship with those institutions. Um, here we have more of this. Uh, we have farmers recognizing the importance of uh, the USDA or their local extension office and how helpful those offices can be, but also recognizing that it's kind of hard to navigate those systems. Um, 
if you're a black farmer because of what has happened in the past that might still influence your willingness to go back and experience more of the same thing so you see somebody saying the term of the loan that they gave me was almost like a plantation owner Okay, so lastly, what showed up in terms of the reason why people choose to engage or not engage is the issue of racialized faces. And what that means is that a lot of time, like the black farmers who are trying to participate in a lot of those program are the only ones there. And that becomes a source of frustration. So you'll see several farmers saying there's very few of us at the workshop. Uh, I'm tired of them not being able to relate to me. I don't feel safe. I don't feel comfortable. Things like that. Is it all doom and gloom? No, there's still some optimism because uh, people are recognizing that there is a shift and that the tide is turning and that there is um, there are more more opportunities coming in and how um, they navigate those opportunities is going to be uh, really uh, important to them. So you see people talking about new programs and grants and all of that that are uh, coming in more than they, ha they are used to seeing. And also recognizing that things are getting better in terms of the experiences that folks are having um, that are not the same, they could be even uh, better, but they are changing a little bit. So here you see down there, somebody saying, uh, go up to the extension office, and it was like, nobody wanted uh, to talk to you in a sense, but now it's better. So what are some of the differences uh, that I see? In terms of how black farmers are adapting, I didn't really see uh, a lot of difference between Ohio and North Carolina. But what I did see and what's not surprising is that farmers in North Carolina were more likely to be multi-generational. They inherited the farm. They've been, they have, uh, I even interview a few folks that were uh, century, like that had century farms. They, the farm had been there in the family for quite some time. Um, also, farmers in Ohio were more likely to mention uh, the extension of the growing season because in North Carolina, nobody noted any type of positive impacts of climate change. But in Ohio, we had folks uh, saying that there is a positive impact and that they have an extension of the growing season. Um, and lastly, that is something that I mentioned before, that... Um, Ohio farmers are more likely to be wary of some uh, agricultural institution because of collective memory, whereas for farmers in North Carolina, it's more so a direct experience. So what are some takeaway from all of this is that there is a need for less restrictive and more flexible program, especially to address the upfront cost of some of those uh, programming um, I didn't include some of those quotes, but the paperwork that people have uh, to go to for even uh, microloans, folks who are mentioning that, that's an issue. The outreach also, it's like depending on the agent them, themselves. So if the agent wants to go the extra mile uh, to do some outreach and uh, reach out to the community, they can do that. But if they don't want to, there's no, um, there's no incentive to go the extra mile. So that's a problem in terms of who they are reaching. Um, what do we need based on what I uh, see in terms of the challenges that the farmers were seeing, a more appropriate uh, programming suited for the needs of smaller scale farmers and the uh, adaptation uh, resources of programming that are being discussed. Smaller scale farmers are not necessarily the target. So uh, for black farmers, a lot of black farmers are small scale farmers. So if they uh, are going to benefit from those programs, there need to be some type of adjustment. And lastly, more and more resources because we can always uh, use a bit more resources. And with that, um, I'll say the implication of not having those type of program is more than less for Black farmers. And this is um, what one farmer uh, told me that I'm going to end with is that um, 
in a few years, if the issues that black farmers are facing are still the same, uh, and if they are exacerbated by climate change, then we might in fact lose more black farmers. 